thank you so much, um, Ramshan Prabhu and Ramchandra Prabhu, for the uh, very <clears throat> warm welcome. And uh, um, I'm so happy I could join all of you at ISKCON Bergen after a long time, as Prabhuji mentioned, I've, I've been uh, remiss in my duty to serve all of you. Uh, so it's good, uh, it's good to be here today. I chose this particular topic uh, because um, it's, um, uh, uh, we're, we're, uh, we're coming up to Gita Jayanti, of course, on Christmas Day, December 25th. And then just a couple of days from now, December 21st, is the, um, uh, uh, is the winter solstice, the day, uh, the, the day when the nights uh, are longest in the year. And after that, uh, we will uh, begin, the sun will enter, begin its northern course when the days start to grow longer again, also known as Uttarayan. And this was the time when uh, Bhishma Dev, the great grandsire of the Kuru dynasty and the famous warrior, uh, when he um, uh, uh, left this world. So he was, remember, many of you will know that he was um, lying on a bed of arrows that were shot by Arjun. And he was there for uh, much of the battle of Kurukshetra. And after that battle was over, then um, Krishna came to him uh, and with the Pandavas and all the uh, rishis and they surrounded him and, and the Lord gave him personal darshan. And um, as he, uh, in the presence of the Lord, he gave wonderful instructions that are described in brief in Srimad Bhagavatam and at great length in Mahabharat on Dharma uh, for uh, Maharaj Yudhishthira who was going to become king. And he, uh, as he was giving these instructions, this the sun entered its northern course, Uttarayan. And this is a time that is considered to be very auspicious for departure. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita also that um, yogis go during the period of Uttarayan. And so at that point, he became silent and he focused his mind and intelligence on Lord Krishna, his vision also, all his senses on the Lord, and departed this world by his own free will, as a yogi does, and also because of the boon that he had received, that he would only depart when he wanted to. So, um, <clears throat> so this is a very auspicious time of the year, um, uh, even though the days are dark, but we're looking forward to longer days coming. Auspicious time of the year, and it's also uh, coming up to Gita Jayanti, of course, uh, which is uh, Mokshada Ekadashi, very auspicious. So I thought we could combine the two topics of Bhagavad Gita and Bhishma Dev because they're both uh, together and, um, and, uh, and talk about Bhishma Dev's appreciation, his view of Bhagavad Gita. So um, when Bhishma Dev is there in front of Krishna and the Pandavas, actually after he finishes his instructions on Dharma and he focuses on Krishna being ready to leave, he starts to remember Krishna's beautiful form and his Leela. And Bhishma Dev's favorite Leela of Krishna is that of Parthasarathi, Krishna as the chariot driver of Arjun. And so um, he remembers that Leela and in, in the process of remembering that, he also remembers Krishna's instructions in uh, um, Bhaga, Krishna's instructions to Arjun on the battlefield, namely Bhagavad Gita. So I thought we could read those verses from Srimad Bhagavatam uh, together. And um, uh, I mean, I will read them and you can uh, stay muted, but read them along. I, I will share my screen so you can follow along those verses. There's like seven, eight verses. And there's one verse in particular, which I'd like to read Shila Prabhupada's purport for. Okay. So uh, please follow along uh, with me on the screen. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. This is Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 9, called The Passing Away of Bhishma Dev in the Presence of Lord Krishna. This is text number 30. Okay. Tado pasing hrityagira sahasranir. Vimukta Sangam Mana Adi Purushe 
कृष्णे लसत्पी तपटे चतुर्भुजे पुरस्थिते मीलित दृग्व्यधारय the translation here by Shila Prabhupada is very, very beautiful. Um, thereupon, that man who spoke on different subjects with thousands of meanings and who fought on thousands of battlefields and protected thousands of men stopped speaking and being completely freed from all bondage, withdrew his mind from everything else and fixed his wide open eyes upon the original personality of Godhead. Shri Krishna, who stood before him, four-handed, dressed in yellow garments that glittered and shined. So uh, one thing I want to just note here before going to the next verse is that um, uh, it, what's very interesting is that as Bhishma Dev is meditating upon Lord Krishna, uh, he is doing so with wide open eyes. Sometimes when we think of uh, mysticism, when we think of meditation, when we think of samadhi, uh, we think, oh, the eyes must be closed in order to do that. But that's only because our eyes lead us in all kinds of, uh, you know, bad places in wrong directions. The senses drag us from one place to another. But if one is a devotee and um, the eyes, the senses are focused on Krishna, then there is no better object of vision than to see the beautiful form of the Lord. And therefore, when we come to the temple, we don't close our eyes. We meditate with our eyes open, wide. It says wide open eyes. So we can drink the form of the Lord uh, through our eyes. This is how the devotees do. It's described so many times. Also, in the third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, it's described how when the four Kumaras went to see Lord Vishnu, they drank the Lord's form through their eyes. Beautiful description. So... In this way, Bhishma Dev is seeing the Lord. Let's move to the next verse here. Vishuddhaya dharanaya hata shubhas tadikshaya eva sugata yudhashrama nivritta sarvendriya vritti vibhramas tushta vajanyam vrishijan janardhanam <clears throat> By pure meditation, looking at Lord Sri Krishna, he at once was freed from all material inauspiciousness and was relieved of all bodily pains caused by the arrow wounds. Thus all the external activities of his senses at once stopped and he prayed transcendentally to the controller of all living beings while quitting his material body. Okay, so this is what Bhishma Dev says. Shri Bhishma Vacha Iti mate rupa kalpita vitrishna Bhagavati satva tapunga ve vibhumni Swasukham upagate kvachid ve hartum Prakritim upe yushi yad bhava pravaha Pishmadev said, Let me now invest my thinking, feeling, and willing, which were so long engaged in different subjects and occupational duties in all powerful Lord Sri Krishna. He is always self-satisfied, but sometimes being the leader of the devotees, he enjoys transcendental pleasure by descending on the material world. Although from him only the material world is created. So it's very nice he's saying that for so long, my, my thinking, feeling and willing were invested. They're engaged in different subjects. Uh, so, you know, he was engaged in politics. He was engaged in battle warfare, he was engaged in family life. So he was busy, like all of us are busy. But the point is there are times in life, not just at the moment of death, we see throughout his life that there are times in life where we need to withdraw ourselves from all our other immediate concerns and just focus ourselves 100% on Krishna. And such moments in a devotee's life are very special, they're very important. Um, and uh, hopefully, in, the, in, the, in, the, in doing our daily sadhana, in our practice of Krishna consciousness, every day we can have a time like this, where we withdraw our, our mind, our senses from being engaged in all these different subjects, and we focus it exclusively on Krishna. So Bhishma Dev is setting the example here. 
Next verse. Tribhuvana Tamanam Tamala Varnam Ravikara Gauram Varam Varam Dadhane Vapura Lakakula Vritana Nabjam Vijaya Sakhe Ratiras Tume Navadhyā. Shri Krishna is the intimate friend of Arjun. He has appeared on this earth in his transcendental body, which resembles the bluish color of the Tamal tree. His body attracts everyone in the three planetary systems, upper, middle, and lower. May his glittering yellow dress and his lotus face covered with paintings of sandalwood pulp be the object of my attraction. And may I not desire fruit of results. Yudhituraga rajo vidhumra vishvak kachalulita shramavarya langkritasye mama nishita sharair vibhidya mana vachivila sat kavaches tu krishna atma. Such beautiful verses, very beautiful Sanskrit he's using here. This is uh, Bhishma Dev is one of the Mahajans. He's one of the 12 great personalities who understands the essence of Krishna, the essence of truth. And um, so his, his language, he's so learned. His language is Sanskrit, very beautiful, very eloquent. Now he describes Krishna, the scene of Krishna as Parthasarathi, as the chariot driver of Arjun. On the battlefield where Sri Krishna attended Arjun out of friendship, the flowing hair of Lord Krishna turned ashen due to the dust raised by the hooves of the horses. And because of his labor, beads of sweat wetted his face. All these decorations, intensified by the wounds dealt by my sharp arrows, were enjoyed by him. Let my mind thus go unto Sri Krishna. Sometimes, you know, it happens in life. We have <clears throat> certain moments which are so uh, powerful and so intense. Um, they're so memorable that we can remember that scene as if it happened yesterday. Perhaps you have some instances like this in your life uh, where you can see every little detail. You can even remember what it smelled like at that time, what the sounds were. So this is one of those moments in Bhishma Dev's life. Uh, his whole life, he's been a wonderful devotee of Krishna. Uh, and this scene of Krishna's Parthasarathi, even though it's in the middle of a battlefield and so much uh, fighting and pain and, and all of that is there. And yet this is the culmination of Bhishma Dev's um, a service to Krishna. This is his relationship with Krishna that we're speaking of. And he's been, he's been waiting for this moment his whole life where he gets to see Krishna in this beautiful form as Parthasarathi. And so he can remember everything. Look at how he's describing Krishna's flowing hair uh, and the color of that hair is normally a uh, very dark black, Krishna's hair. And, uh, but it's turned uh, ashen, it's turned gray because of the dust from the hooves of the um, horses because he's sitting right there next to the horses, right? So all that dust is coming in his face. And he can even remember the little beads of sweat on his face, how much detail he remembers about Krishna. So when we, when we have darshan of the Lord in the temple, this is how we should have darshan, right? With that, with that intensity of focus, that what is Krishna wearing on his nose today? What is he wearing? on his ears, what are, what are his eyes and lips looking like? Especially what is his lotus feet like? Are there decorations there? Are there tulsi leaves there? Are there flowers, right? In this way, we should have darshan in such a way as if it was the last time we were gonna have Krishna's darshan. Sometimes people go to the temple, you know, we, we, we go there and we just, we, we bow our heads and we come back and we don't uh, pay attention. Uh, I know, when people first start coming to the temple, darshan is mostly a ritual activity. And the idea is that I went and humne ja ke matha take liya apna aur kaam pura ho gaya. And you put your head down, you put something in the hundi and your work is done. Uh, but the, and, and I remember one person uh, who used to come to the Boise temple, they came something like for six months, every week, every Sunday. And one Sunday uh, they came to me and they said, uh, uh, 
um, oh, you changed Krishna's dress this week. And of course, every week we're changing Krishna's dress without fail, right? But that was the first time after six months of having darshan that that person realized actually Krishna is looking different today. So this is real progress in our Krishna consciousness. That when we come to, this is, uh, we are, uh, as devotees, we are yogis with wide open eyes. Okay? So most yogis are with closed eyes, but we are open-eyed yogis because we are always eager to use our senses in Krishna's service. And the best use of the eyes is to see his beautiful form. So um, in this way, Bhishma Dev had darshan so in such a focused way that he can remember the beads of sweat. He can remember the, the color of Krishna's hair. And most importantly, he can remember the wounds on Krishna's body that were dealt by his own arrows. And this is something Bhishma Dev is quite proud of. And we might look at it and we say, how is this a devotee? A devotee is happy that he has given pain to Krishna. And, uh, and the answer is yes. Uh, Prabhupada explains in the purport, a very beautiful purport. He explains that there are different moods in which the devotees serve Krishna. And in this particular mood, Bhishma Dev, uh, this, uh, his, his mood at this time was a virya of uh, virya rasa, of uh, chivalry. Uh, he was like uh, in a fighting mood, it's just like sometimes two brothers or two friends, two children will wrestle with each other, or even father and children will, will wrestle, wrestle. And it's not that they become enemies. Uh, it's, it's very enjoyable. And Prabhupada explains in the purport, he says something quite interesting. He says that the, the, the arrows that Bhishma Dev shot at Krishna, those wounds, those wounds felt like the, the, the wounds caused by a lover who bites the one he loves or she loves, right? So uh, just like when two people love each other, sometimes in those intensity, they might bite each other. Uh, so in the same way, that, that bite is painful, yes, but it's not painful actually, right? And so in the same way, this pain caused by his arrows, um, this was for Krishna, it was like, um, uh, bites of love. And the arrows themselves uh, were like showers of flowers on Krishna's body. So very special, very special relationship. Uh, means uh, from Bhishma, from the world's perspective, uh, from the average person's perspective, Bhishma Dev and Krishna are fighting their enemies. But what is going on inside them, between them, only they know. And only the devotee knows what is happening there. Sometimes we cannot recognize what is happening in the life, in the mind of a devotee. It may seem that the devotee is struggling, is fighting. What is this? But in their heart, what is happening in relationship with Krishna? We don't know. So <clears throat> very nice verse. Now he continues with this vision of the battlefield. Sapati Sakhi Vacho Nishamya Madhye in obedience to the command of his friend, Lord Sri Krishna entered the arena of the battlefield of Kurukshetra between the soldiers of Arjun and Duryodhan. And while there, he shortened the lifespan of the opposite party by his merciful glance. This was done simply by his looking at the enemy. Let my mind be fixed upon that Krishna. And now we come to the Bhagavad Gita verse. Vyavahita pritana mukham nirikshya svajana vadha vimukhasya dosha buddhya kumati maharadatma vidya yayash when Arjun was seemingly polluted by ignorance upon observing the soldiers and commanders before him on the battlefield, the Lord eradicated his ignorance by delivering transcendental knowledge. May his lotus feet always remain the object of my attraction. So this is Bhishma Dev 
remembering uh, uh, Krishna's instructions of Bhagavad Gita. Again, I'll read the translation. When Arjun was seemingly polluted by ignorance upon observing the soldiers and commanders before him on the battlefield, the Lord eradicated his ignorance by delivering transcendental knowledge. May his lotus feet always remain the object of my attraction. Purport by his divine grace, Srila Prabhupada. The kings and the commanders were to stand in front of the fighting soldiers. That was the system of actual fighting. The kings and commanders were not so-called presidents or ministers of defense as they are today. They would not stay home while the poor soldiers or mercenaries were fighting face to face. This may be the regulation of modern democracy, but when actual monarchy was prevailing, the monarchs were not cowards elected without consideration of qualification. As it was, as it was evident from the battlefield of Kurukshetra, all the executive heads of both parties like Drona, Bish, B, Drona, Bhishma, Arjun, and Duryodhan were not sleeping. All of them were actual participants in the fighting, which was selected to be executed at a place away from the civil residential quarters. This means that the innocent citizens were immune from all effects of fighting between the rival royal parties. The citizens had no business in seeing what was going to happen during such fighting. They were to pay one fourth of their income to the ruler, whether he be Arjun or Duryodhan. All the commanders of the parties on the battlefield of Kurukshetra were standing face to face, and Arjun saw them with great compassion and lamented that he was to kill his kinsmen on the battlefield for the sake of the empire. He was not at all afraid of the giant military phalanx presented by Duryodhan, but as a merciful devotee of the Lord, Renunciation of worldly things was natural for him, and thus he decided not to fight for worldly possessions. But this was due to a poor fund of knowledge, and therefore it is said here that his intelligence became polluted. His intelligence could not be polluted at any time because he was a devotee and constant companion of the Lord, as is clear in the fourth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Apparently, Arjun's intelligence became polluted because otherwise there would not have been a chance to deliver the teachings of Bhagavad Gita for the good of all polluted conditioned souls engaged in material bondage by the conception of the false material body. The Bhagavad Gita was delivered to, to the conditioned souls of the world to deliver them from the wrong conception of identifying the body with the soul and to reestablish the soul's eternal relationship with the Supreme Lord. So this is a very nice summary sentence of the purpose of the Bhagavad Gita. I will read it again here. The Bhagavad Gita was delivered to the conditioned souls of the world to deliver them from the wrong conception of identifying the body with the soul and to reestablish the soul's eternal relation with the Supreme Lord. Okay, so two things. Uh, our false conception that I am this material body and once we recognize we're actually the Atma, the spirit soul, then what is our relationship with the Lord? Atma Vidya, or transcendental knowledge of himself, was spoken by the Lord for the benefit of all concerned in all parts of the universe. So before I speak, I'll, let's read two more verses, or three more verses, uh, just to complete uh, um, uh, Bhishma Dev's vision of Krishna on the battlefield. Svanigamam apahaya mat pratignam Ritam adhikartum av adhikartum avapluto rathastha Ritaratacharano bhyaya chaladgur Haririvahantum evam go gato tariya. This is another very beautiful verse. Fulfilling my desire and sacrificing his own promise. Now, Krishna's promise was what? To never pick up a weapon on the battlefield. So, he, he breaks his promise by picking up the wheel of the chariot. He says, fulfilling my desire. But this was Bhishma Dev's desire. He wanted to see Krishna break his promise. Just so the world could see that Krishna's promise to his devotees is greater than his promises for himself. On his own, he said, I'm not going to fight because he wanted to remain neutral. But that ne neutrality goes right out the window when Krishna's devotee is in danger. Arjun was in danger, and Bhishma Dev purposely put him in danger just to see how Krishna fulfills the promise he made in Bhagavad Gita, which is Name Bhakta Pranashyati, Konteya Pratijanihi Name Bhakta Pranashyati. 
oh, Arjun, you should declare it boldly that my devotee never perishes. So just to, just to fulfill that promise, uh, he had to break his own promise. And this is what Bhishma Dev, uh, he wanted to show to the world. See, what Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, it is true. It's not false. And watch what Krishna is willing to do uh, uh, to, to uh, protect his devotee. Fulfilling my desire and sacrificing his own promise, he got down from the chariot, took up its wheel, and ran towards me hurriedly, just as a lion goes to kill an elephant. He even dropped his outer garment on the way. Now, I want you to notice one thing here, that Bhishmadev is describing himself as an elephant. The Lord is a lion, and he is an elephant. Now, these days we're not so familiar with these things, but if you go to such places like Africa, you can still see lions attacking elephants. And in the end, the lion is victorious, but it's not an easy match between the lion and the elephant because the elephant is very strong and powerful. So notice here uh, that he's comparing himself to an elephant. And we might say, well, you know, um, <sighs> How is it that a devotee is, he seems to be so proud here. Why doesn't he say like a lion uh, chases after a rabbit? Uh, no, because Bhishma Dev, this is his mood with Lord Krishna, right? The way he serves Krishna is by being a good match. What fun is there to wrestle with someone whom you can crush just with your finger? This is, this is not enjoyable, right? If you want to fight, you want to wrestle, you need a match who's your equal. And so he's telling him that I, I put up a good fight in front of the Lord. So good, in fact, that Krishna had to break his promise. And moreover, he even dropped his outer garment on the way. Just to show how uh, panicked Krishna was to protect his devotee. What a situation Bhishma Dev had created. That in all this rush, the Lord lost his uttariya, gatottariya, it says. Uttariya, gata, it's gone his upper garment, and he had to, uh, he, he left that, and bare-chested, he ran towards Bhishma Dev. And at that point, of course, we know. Then Bhishma Dev said, okay, now no more fighting. Now that I've accomplished what I wanted the Lord to do, I've made the Lord show what I wanted him to show, not that now that I've I had darshan of him in the form that I wanted to see him, now, Krishna, you can come and kill me, no problem. I'm yours, you do what you like. And, and then, uh, of course, Arjun stopped him at that point. The Lord was so upset, he would have finished Bhishma Dev. But Arjun stopped him and said, look, this is not your promise, right? Your promise was not to fight, so it's okay. Last verse, actually, uh, I think, uh, okay, um, two more, okay, very beautiful verses. May he, Lord Sri Krishna, the personality of Godhead who awards salvation, be my ultimate destination. On the battlefield, he charged me as if angry because of the wounds dealt by my sharp arrows. His shield was scattered and his body was smeared with blood due to the wounds. Uh, if you look at the italic sentence that Prabhupada italicizes in its purport, it raises the point that I was mentioning earlier. The astounding feature of such dealings is that a devotee can please the Lord by playing the part of an enemy. And the last one. His prayers continue, but this is the last one in his meditation on Krishna as Parthasarathi, the chariot driver of Arjun, as the speaker of Bhagavad Gita. This is the last verse. Vijaya ratha kutumba ata totre, dhrita haya rashmini tatsri ekshaniye, Bhagavati rati rastume mumur shor, yamiha niriksha hata gata swarupam. At the moment of death, let my, my, let my ultimate attraction be to Sri Krishna, the personality of Godhead. I concentrate my mind upon the chariot driver of Arjun, who stood 
with a whip in his right hand and a bridle rope in his left, who was very careful to give protection to Arjun's chariot by all means. Those who saw him on the battlefield of Kurukshetra attained their original forms after death. Om Agnyar Timiran Dasyatyana Anjana Shalaka Chakshurun Militam Jena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. So um, I think this is a, this, these verses are a very beautiful and very powerful description of the scene in which Bhagavad Gita is spoken. And uh, Bhishma Dev, a Lord's pure devotee, his vision, his view of the Bhagavad Gita. Um, there's a uh, professor at um, University of Chicago uh, named Davey, David Tracy. Uh, who explains in his book uh, how, um, what, what does it mean for a book to be a classic? We, sometimes we speak of classics, like a classic of world literature, like Shakespeare wrote classics of drama. So what does it mean for a book to be a classic? And he says, uh, a um, classic work is one that has an excess of meaning, an overflow of meaning. In other words, there's no point at which you read that book and then you say, okay, I um, learned everything there is to, to, to learn from it. I got everything there it has to teach me. I have enjoyed whatever there is to enjoy in the book. Now I'm done with it. I, there's, a classic is a work which is always overflowing with meaning. That is, no matter how many times you read it, uh, no matter how many times you study, you always have more to gain from it, more to enjoy, more to relish. Uh, that's one characteristic, he says. Another characteristic of a classic is a work that is uh, relevant across, um, across vast periods of time. Okay? So it's not a work that is a period piece. That is, it was interesting to people in the 19th century, but after that, it, it was forgotten. Or it was interesting to people now, but we expect in 50 years, no one's gonna read this novel anymore. Not books like that, but books that have stood the test of time. And that speak, he says, to across cultures. So a classic is a work, of course, any work will be appreciated in the village in which it was written. But if we can say it was appreciated across the nation, if we can say it was appreciated across cultures and civilizations, then yes, we're talking about a classic. And in fact, if you hear these characteristics, he's practically describing Bhagavad Gita. Right? This is a work that has been read across thousands of years. It has been appreciated across cultures, practically every country and every language of the world. Now, the Bhagavad Gita is amongst the top translated books in the world right alongside the Bible and the Tao Te Ching, a Chinese classic, Bhagavad Gita. These are like translated all over the world in every language. Uh, Prabhupada's Gita is translated something like 60 languages. So it's something that people have read across cultures, scientists, philosophers, artists, teachers, um, business people. Um, everyone has read, politicians read and appreciated, used the Bhagavad Gita uh, to help them. Uh, and and uh, and of course, it's um, it's uh, it's got an an overflow of meaning. <laughs> There's always more to say about Bhagavad Gita. Uh, for how many thousands of years have people been giving classes on Bhagavad Gita, and still there's more to know, more to learn, more to understand in our own lives. Uh, yes, I mean, some of us may have read Bhagavad Gita for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And still we can pick up the book and appreciate how beautiful it is, what is being said. And we say, oh, I never noticed this before. This is so, this is really interesting. Or this speaks to me today. I was having some struggle and this verse is helping me. Uh, as Gandhiji said, you know, every day I pick up uh, Bhagavad Gita, I read one verse and it speaks to me with new meanings, fresh meanings every single day. So the Gita is clearly a classic. And because of its overflow of meaning, every uh, great thinker and um, philosopher has read the Gita and found in it what is most 
uh, appreciable and powerful for them. So if you look at Gandhiji's comments on Bhagavad Gita, for example, he says that the climax, the pinnacle, the essence of Bhagavad Gita, you know which verses he felt were most important? Chapter two of Bhagavad Gita, near the end, I think starting text 54, something like that, where Krishna describes the qualities of the Stita Dhi Muni, the sage of steady mind. Arjuna asks him, uh, um, uh, um, Stita Pragnasya Ka Bhasha. He says that this person of steady mind, how does he speak? How does he sit? How does he walk? Tell me what that person of steady intelligence is like. And then Krishna describes the qualities of that person. Uh, he is in equilibrium, uh, in, in good or bad, in happiness or distress, victory or defeat. That person is always steady. So uh, Gandhiji felt this was the, the cream of the Gita. In fact, he said something quite radical. He said, the author of the Bhagavad Gita had nothing further to say after, after chapter two. Okay? So he said, everything that was useful was in chapter two. <laughs> nothing more beyond it. So of course, we don't uh, agree with that perspective. Um, we'll explain why in just a minute. But then if you look at um, most Western uh, readers and scholars of Bhagavad Gita, you know what section of the Gita they find most interesting? And they find to be the climax of the Gita is typically chapter 11, when Krishna shows his Vishwarupa, his universal form. <clears throat> because that is so awesome and so majestic that they argue that uh, this, is, this is the real God. Krishna is showing his actual form. Uh, um, of course, uh, chapter at the end of chapter 11 shows that uh, this is not the actual form and it's not the most desirable form either. Arjun, the perfect devotee and listener of Gita, he doesn't like this Vishwarup form. He says, uh, please take it away. He wants to see Krishna's Somya Rup, his beautiful form. But for someone who's coming in from the outside, uh, this pretty impressive uh, vision in chapter 11, right? Karala uh, Dangstra, his teeth are so fearsome and his uh, sahasra netra, his eye, thousands of eyes, and, and people are bowing to him from the front and from the back and from, from the sides, and all the devas are there. This is a vision of power and majesty. Very impressive. Very impressive. So, um, uh, for example, uh, you know Robert Oppenheimer? Uh, he was the, um, the, the lead scientist of the... Um, of the um, Manhattan Project, the, the research team that discovered and tested the first atomic bomb and uh, the bomb that was eventually dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And um, he, uh, when the Trinity test was done in New Mexico, the first explosion of the atomic bomb, it was tested in New Mexico. Uh, at that point, when the bomb exploded, uh, Robert Oppenheimer uh, quoted two verses from Bhagavad Gita. He was actually a great lover of the Gita uh, when he studied at University of Berkeley. And there he, he specifically took courses in Sanskrit just so he could read the Bhagavad Gita in the original text. And on his bookshelf, right in front of his desk, he always used to keep one copy of Bhagavad Gita. It was bound in pink. He had bound it himself and he used to keep it there always. In fact, he liked the Gita so much and Krishna that he had nicknamed his own car Garuda after Lord Vishnu's um, uh, uh, eagle carrier. So he, he, he really loved Bhagavad Gita. And when the atomic bomb exploded, uh, he quoted two verses uh, from the Gita. And perhaps you can guess which ones they might be. They were from chapter 11. Uh, the first one uh, was uh, when Sanjay says, if a thousand suns were to rise in the sky at the same time, that would be the brilliance of this universal form. Uh, and the second one that he uh, quoted when he saw the awesome power of the bomb and its destructive power is Kalosmi Sarvakshaya Krit Pravidho. When Arjun asks Krishna, um, uh, Who are you? Why have you taken this form? And Krishna says, Time I am the great destroyer of these worlds. Kalosmi. And Arjun begins to tremble even more hearing those words. So uh, 
Uh, this word kal can also mean death. Right? So in his translation, in Robert Oppenheimer's translation, it, it was the sentence with, I am death, come to destroy these worlds. And this was his, for him, the vision of that atomic bomb. In fact, his official biography is called A Thousand Sons. You can look it up. It's called A Thousand Sons, named after this quote from the Bhagavad Gita. So um, Gandhiji thought chapter two was the climax. Uh, Robert Oppenheimer, many others in the West have felt chapter 11 was the climax. But when Vaishnavas, that is devotees of Krishna, study Bhagavad Gita, and particularly as Srila Prabhupada explains it, Bhagavad Gita as it is, then for uh, Vaishnavas, the important thing is not to bring their own agenda to the study of the Gita. If I'm a politician, I want to bring this view of the Gita with me. You see, uh, everyone brings that agenda. Just like during Gandhiji, his, his mission was nonviolence. So when he read the Bhagavad Gita, he said it's teaching nonviolence. Others during the same time, at his contemporaries, read Bhagavad Gita, and they said, no, Gita is teaching us to fight and be violent and to attack the British. So people bring their own agendas to the Gita, depending on what is important to them. But the question that a devotee asks is what is Krishna's agenda in Bhagavad Gita? What is the author's, the speaker's own agenda? If we are looking for the most important verses in Bhagavad Gita, how about we look at the structure of the Gita itself to see what the author considers to be most important? Okay, so let's go through some of those verses that the Vaishnavas consider to be the most important, the cream of the Gita, and see why those are considered to be important, why they're they considered to be key. I can choose any verse I like and say it's the most important because I like it. Like at the end, Krishna says, Yatechasi tatha kuru. As you desire, so you act. Do whatever you want. So I can say, oh, that's my favorite verse on the Gita. But that's because I want to do what I, whatever I want. Right? But if we look for Krishna's, what does Krishna highlight as the most important in the Gita? So a few verses. One is you might think, uh, you might remember that there's uh, the Chatur Shroki Bhagavad Gita, the four essential verses of Gita. Uh, chapter 10, text number 8, 9, 10, and 11. Uh, you can remember the verse numbers very easily. I have a hard time remembering verse numbers. I can remember verses, but I, it's tough remembering verse numbers. But this one is easy. 10.8. Okay. Now remove the point. What does it come to? 108. Hmm? Very easy to remember. That's the first essential verse of Bhagavad Gita. 108. So what does Krishna say? Um, there, uh, he's describing, I am the cause of the material in the spiritual world. Aham sarvasya prabhavo, matta sarvam pravartate. Iti matva bhajante mam. Those who know this, they worship me. Buddha bhava samanvita, with a lot of feeling. And then he says, for those who worship me, I give them the understanding by which they can come to me. I destroy jnana deepena bhasvata. With the lamp of knowledge, I destroy the darkness of ignorance. So you can say, well, you know, this is, you, the bhaktas, the Vaishnavas, they like bhakti for Krishna, so they just choose the verses that focus on bhakti, right? But no, if you notice where these verses come, why are these chosen as essential? Because right after this, these verses are done, what happens? Arjun, for the first time in the Gita, has a change of heart. He surrenders. Right after this comes the verse, Param Brahma, Param Dhamma, Pavitram Paramam Bhavan, Arjun says. Purusham Shatam Divyam Adivam Ajam Vibhum. He says, Krishna, uh, I, you are Param Brahma, the highest, the highest reality. Param Dhamma, the supreme abode. Pavitram, the purest Bhavan. Purusham Shashvatam Divyam. He, 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 the, the language of those verses is such that Arjun is just in ecstasy. He's just exploding with joy at that point. And, um, and so uh, uh, we see, and he says, He says, now you have told me the truth that everyone else has said. I accept what you're saying to me. So 
This is the first time in the Gita, the first time that Arjun is not skeptical. Up to this point, he speaks and it's kind of like, he says, well, Krishna, you said this one, then you said that, then you I don't understand what you're saying. This is all confusing. 10 chapters it took. At this point, Arjun is finally um, convinced, at least partially convinced, not entirely, but partially. So this is why the structure of the Gita shows us that this, these verses were transformative for Arjun. At chapter nine of Bhagavad Gita is very dear to Vaishnavas. If there's one chapter that we quote, quote the most from, it's probably nine. Patram pushpam phalam toyam yome bhaktiya prayachati. Krishna says, offer leaf, flower, food, or water to me. I will accept it. Um, so many nice verses are from uh, chapter nine. Raja vidya, raja guhyam. And uh, we um, quote and quote and quote from there. Yad karoshi, yad ashnasi, yad juhosi, yad. Whatever you do, offer it. Whatever you offer, give it to me. And all of chapter nine is focused on bhakti. So again, you might say, uh, see the Vaishnavas are after bhakti, so they just choose the verses. They choose the chapter that's favorable for them, that works. But no, it's not exactly just our choice. It is our choice, but it is first Krishna's choice. You know how he begins chapter nine? He says, when he starts the chapter, he says, Idam tute guhyatamam pravaksham yanasu yave jnanam jnana sahitam yajgnyatva mokshesu. My dear Arjun, idam, this what I'm going to tell you, tute guhyatamam, it's the most secret knowledge. Vigyana uh, sahitam, not only is it knowledge, but it's also vigyan, practical application. And if you know it, moksha shubhat, you're going to get moksha. It's sanya moksha dai kadashi. You're going to get moksha, with this knowledge. Then again, he said, Raja Vidya, Raja Vidyam. This is the king of knowledge. So it's Krishna who tells us chapter nine is the most important. Then again, devotees really like the verse, Sarva Dharman Parityajya Mame Kam Sharanam Raja. You may have heard it many times. That give up all varieties of dharma and surrender alone, and I will protect you. Do not fear. Okay, devotees like Krishna, so they choose a verse of surrender, right? It's our bias. No, it's Krishna's bias. He mentions, what does he say just before these verses come? He says, Sarva Guhyatamam Bhuta Shnume Paramam He says, my dear Arjun, now listen to my supreme instruction once again. Guhyatamam Bhuya. Again, Bhuya means again. Guhya Tamam, in chapter 9, the most secret. Oh, secret, but is, is it the best? Yes. Shunume, Shunume, here. It's an order, command. Shunume, Paramam Vacha. Paramam means highest. Vacha means words. Listen to my highest teaching. Now, why is he saying, listen to this highest teaching? Again, Bhuya, because he's actually already. The verse he says right after this, Shinume Paramam Vacha, he says, Mana Bhavamad Bhakto Madhyaji Mam Namaskuru. Think of me, become my devotee, offer your obeisance to me. That verse is three quarters identical to a verse in chapter nine, the last verse in chapter nine. Krishna tells the greatest secret there, then he repeats and says, Now I will tell you the greatest secret here again. Right? So we can read the Bhagavad Gita for many purposes. It'll be useful for so It's good for management. It's good for ethics. It's good for corporations. It's good to liberate a nation from corruption. It's good for so many things. It's good to create an atomic bomb, if that's your focus. But if you want to know what Krishna has in focus, what is his focus? Then we have to see what he says, what he tells us. Right? We have to read the Bhagavad Gita with that in mind. That what is Krishna's message? How is he structuring? Every scripture will give us the method for its own understanding. 
every scripture will give us the means by which we should understand that scripture. We don't have to go outside and say, now what's the method for understanding Gita? No, the Gita it will say, do it like this. Arjun, you can understand this message because you are my devotee and you are my friend. And now this is the most important thing I tell you. So Krishna is telling us, he's, he's guiding us how to read Bhagavad Gita. Then we can accept it as it is. And if we accept it as it is, then we get the greatest benefit from the Gita. You can get many side effects from the Gita. But if you want the greatest benefit, moksha shubha, liberation from all that is inauspicious in life, then we need to understand Gita in the way the author asks us to understand it, in the way that he structured it. And therefore, in the purport of this verse that we just read, Prabhupada had said, uh, he said that Gita is about Atma Gnan. Atma Gnan, and he translates Atma Gnan as knowledge. Krishna giving knowledge of himself. I don't know if you caught that sentence, but it says, this Bhagavad Gita is Atma Gyan, which is knowledge, a Krishna giving knowledge of himself. You can say, well, what is this? Atma Gyan means knowledge of the self, of me. But no, the word Atma in Sanskrit is a reflexive pronoun. It means myself, oneself. Is what Atma, it's a pronoun. Just like I say, I did this myself. So what is that myself referring to? To the speaker of the sentence, me. So when Krishna says Atma, he's giving Atma Gyan. This is, he says Maam, Aham in his sentence. Manmana Bhava Mad Bhakto, Mad Yaji, Maam Namaskuru. So Maam, Manmana Bhava Mad Bhakto, me, 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 me. That's a reflexive pronoun referring to the speaker. This is actually a litmus test for Bhagavad Gita commentaries. If you want to check on a, a, a commentator to see, are they giving as it is Bhagavad Gita or not? Then just look for this one simple thing. How do they translate the word aham? I. How do they, sorry, not translate, explain the word aham or mom, me? This first person pronoun you will see that nine out of 10 commentaries of Bhagavad Gita try to work around that word. By me, mom, uh, Krishna ref is referring to the eternal spirit found in all beings. Or by me, Krishna is referring to the greater self within him. Or by me, Krishna is referring to the conscience found in you. And in this way, they, they take a meaning from the text that is not the direct meaning of what is being said. It's Krishna speaking reflexively. He's standing there before Arjun and he's saying me. This is why for Vaishnavas all across the board, throughout thousands of years of history, the key message of the Gita is about the relationship between the speaker and the listener, between Krishna and Arjun. That is the heart of Bhagavad Gita for Vaishnavas. Because that is what Krishna is highlighting. My dear Arjun, I'm going to tell you my greatest instruction, my most secret instruction. Why? Pravakshyami anasuyave, because you are without envy to me. Now let me speak to you this Bhagavad Gita, bhakto sime sakacheti, because you are my friend, you might devote. Now, Listen to this greatest instruction of mine, Shunume Paramam Vacha. Do you know what, what, what he says right after that? This highest instruction, Shunume Paramam Vacha, I'm going to tell you, Ishto Sime Dridamiti. Why? Because you are my very dear one. Ishto Sime, you are my beloved. Dridam, very much, you are dear to me. This is why. I'm telling you, Paramam Vacha, my highest instruction. And then he says, what is his highest instruction? You love me. Bhavamad Bhakto. So he's saying, I'm going to tell you the instruction because I love you. And you now, what is that instruction? You love me back, please. 
this is the essence of the Gita, the relationship between Krishna and his devotees. And this is why when Bhishma Dev is remembering Krishna, the speaker of Bhagavad Gita the, on the battlefield, what is he remembering? He is remembering the relationship between Arjun and Krishna. He is calling uh, uh, Krishna Vijaya Sakhe. You are the friend of Arjun, Vijaya. And he's calling him Partha Sakhe. You are the friend of Parth, of, of Arjun, the son of Pitha Kunti. He's remembering Krishna there on the battlefield as Arjun's friend, as his charioteer, as his attendant. He's remembering his relationship with Krishna. And that is how he remembers Bhagavad Gita. If we want to understand Gita, we have to come to the Gita with that mood. That we are listening to a conversation between two friends. Between uh, guru and disciple. Between... Um, a, a warrior and his charioteer. We have to see those relationships present. We have to see the conversation that is happening. Then we can appreciate the message of the Gita. When we remember it as Arjun did, and we remember it as Bhishma Dev is doing here. So my time is up. I will stop here and see if there are any questions or comments that any of you may have. Thank you all so much for listening. Hare Krishna, Vajis. thank you very much for such a wonderful lecture class. It's really enlightened all of us. Prabhuji, uh, I will request uh, um, before I open the floor for question answers, I will quickly make a quick announcements before I lose the debate. We share the screen real quick. So uh, on Wednesday, 23rd, uh, we, we have a wonderful class will be given by His Grace uh, Anuttama Prabhuji. The topic will be unwrapping the Christmas. It's uh, uh, right on the event, which we are going to celebrate soon. And then Friday, 25th, um, we are going to have um, Gita Jayanti uh, celebration. So Gita was spoken 5,000 years ago, and it is an auspicious day of uh, uh, Mokshada Ekadashi. So we'll be reciting the entire uh, Bhagavad Gita. Uh, please join. And this time, uh, this is the first time we are doing uh, like a, in two separate uh, Zoom logins. So, so one for Sanskrit and one for English translations. So it's a good opportunity to recite the entire Bhagavad Gita and hear. So plan your evening accordingly. And the Sunday 27th, uh, our Sunday school children will recite the Bhagavad Gita slokas. Uh, please join and support and encourage them. And they are working so hard to memorize the verses and all. And Thursday 31st, we have wonderful New Year's Eve program is coming up. So uh, it will start at 7 p.m. and until midnight. So more information is following and uh, we meet every Monday. Uh, to discuss about how we can uh, plan the event. So you're welcome to join uh, with your ideas and thoughts and we'll be meeting tomorrow, uh, 8.30 in the same. So with that saying, uh, so uh, Prabhuji, just I will give, uh, before I open the floor for the questions, I'll just give just a one minute quick summary what, what we heard today from you. Uh, so, uh, you explained uh, uh, about the Gita Jayanti and especially the Bhagavad Gita, um, about the Bhishma Dev's appreciation of Bhagavad Gita. Um, and also you talked about the, it's, uh, the wide open uh, eyes meditation. Uh, and also you mentioned the practical tips that uh, um, how Bhishma Dev was um, um, meditating on Lord Krishna. And also you mentioned um, um, 
the how how freshly he remembered the moments uh, that uh, on, on that battlefield uh, uh, how the even the to the very minute details uh, how he even remember the the sweat coming out of the lord so how we need to approach the lord when we go to the temples and all and uh, uh, bishma dev's um, uh, chivalrous uh, um, spirit the rasa with the lord that is something for outside people it's like a fighting but uh, there is some uh, very low and exchange reciprocation is going on between the devotee and uh, lord krishna um uh, pros you also touched upon the um, uh, how uh, krishna fulfill his promises uh, to protect his devotees by breaking his own promises and that's a very nice analogy like a krishna is a described lion and the bishma dev himself as elephant and um, the most important Gently, you explain that the Bhagavad Gita. How how classic is that? Like a, how it is still kind of a, we have a timeless wisdom. We can always uh, access that. And you also mentioned about the two personalities, Robert Oberheimer and Bhagavad uh, and the Gandhi ji. How they use the Bhagavad Gita. And also you explained that uh, the their agenda uh, and versus Vaishnava's agenda while reading and appreciating in Bhagavad Gita. And uh, you also talked about the how to read bhagavad gita uh, with the right perspective and bhagavad gita is all about the atma gnana sir knowledge about himself and we are we, in a simple sentence you summarize that bhagavad gita in a like a i a, ultimate message is lord krishna is telling i love you and you love me so with that uh, i will open the floor for questions uh, please uh, raise your hands i think i already see Uh, hands was raised so i will uh, ask uh, first sulabha mata ji could you please unmute and you can ask your question uh, hare krishna prabhu dandavat pranam all glories to shri prabhupada and gurudev hare krishna please ask uh, radhakaram prabhu can you hear me yes very clearly thank you hare krishna uh, sulabha prabhu hare krishna prabhu thank you prabhu Uh, uh the question i have is uh i think i i touched earlier also uh, with you um still my mind is going there only uh he spoke such a length uh, about krishna but uh, krishna appeared as as a four-handed form of narayana and uh, the question is um yeah i read the, the purport 1924 and uh, the question i got is basically um is it the choice of our uh, uh ch- which form of the god we like is basically is the choice of the uh, embodied soul the conditioned life or is eternally we had that connection uh, whether it is narayana ramachandra or narsimhadev who who is this? is eternally there or conditioned life we developed it uh, can, can you a bit uh, elaborated on that one prabhu yes Thank you for that nice question. And since Subhat Sakha Prabhu is here, I I should mention one thing is um, for uh, any of you who attend uh, sometimes both uh, this forum and the Tawako forum, I'm giving exactly the same class in Tawako on Tuesday. So please don't come for that. Otherwise, you'll just get very bored uh, listening to the same class again. <laughs> okay, just a warning in case anyone was planning to go there also, since I know Subhat Sakha Prabhu sometimes goes. So um anyway uh, what i was going to say uh, is um yeah so bishma dev you are correct in that bishma dev in his prayers he's remembering krishna as uh, as chatur bhuja a uh, four armed narayan form and he actually um in verse 24 earlier in the in the prayers he meditates on the lord as narayan as four arms and and, and chatur bhuja roop so bishma dev's a uh, basic relationship with the lord was one of dasyaras of 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 master and servant and uh it, with that uh, the the um the feeling of virya rasa or chivalrous uh, feeling is is uh, is a secondary rasa so there the primary rasas are 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 connected to sthayi bhavas they're they're sthayi they're they're steady they're permanent uh, so master and servant friend and friend uh, parent and child uh lover and beloved these are stable um they're, they're the foundational moods but occasionally in those moods other secondary rasas can emerge like laughter or like uh, different things 
So in this case, the chivalrous mood is there. But his foundational mood to the Lord is he understands that Krishna, okay, in that moment, he was treating Krishna like an equal, like a lion and an elephant. I'm going to fight. And it was a very special moment. He's remembering it. But his foundational mood towards the Lord is he understands Krishna is the supreme personality of God. He is Adi Narayana. He is the original Narayana. And he prefers to worship and remember Krishna in that form. Now, one thing you will notice is that after these prayers are done, just after the verse I stopped at today, the next couple of verses meditate on Krishna and Vrindavan. He's remembering Krishna's Leela with the gopis. So this means that even devotees in one particular rasa can appreciate the existence of other rasas, right? But that um, it's from a distance. He knows that this is something very special that happens in Vrindavan. Uh, and these are very advanced devotees. And he does namaskar and says, this is amazing how Krishna is so sweet in Vrindavan. He's not like forearm Narayan. No one bows before him there. He's dancing with the gopis. Uh, so in the same way, when Queen Kunti remembers Krishna in her prayers in first canto, then she's remembering Krishna's Damodar Lila. And she's appreciating it. And she's saying, Ati Vidambanam. This is very, very confusing. Right? So she appreciates from a distance, but that is not her mood. Now, in terms of your question, is it something we choose or is it, is it something that's eternally there? My understanding is that uh, it is something that is eternally our nature. Right? Nitya Siddha Krishna Prem Sadhya Kabunai Shravanadi Shuddha Chitte Karaya Udai. That it's our, our relationship with Krishna, Jivera Swarupoy Krishna Nitya Das. Our a relationship as servant of Krishna, whatever that samanda might be, is eternal. It's always there within the heart of the jiva. But uh, by um, hearing and chanting, it karaya udai, it rises. Just like the sun, when it is under the horizon, it has not died. And when it comes up in the morning, it is not that the sun is created in the morning. In the same way, when we recover, when we remember our eternal relationship with Krishna, that relationship is not being created or chosen at that time. Rather, it is eternally present. It is always there. And this is my understanding, but of course, this is a very deep and uh, difficult subject about which even many Vaishnavas uh, have difference of opinion. Uh, but in general, as Srila Prabhupada has explained to us that uh, this is something that is always there. And he said, he gave the example that uh, just as... Um, are, are, are the clothes we wear is, uh, is, um, uh, is uh, shaped just like our physical body, same size, the profits, so on. So in the same way, the moods that we experience in Krishna consciousness, when we become purified, they more or less match uh, the, uh, our eternal relationship with Krishna. Uh, of course, those moods here is the problem. So long as we are conditioned, how can we make a choice? Because we have no eyes to see. Our eyes are blinded by our, um, uh, our conditioning. And when we are unconditioned, uh, when we are purified, then our relationship becomes very clear with the Lord. It becomes self-evident. It becomes immediately apparent. Um, so it's there. It's eternally there, our relationship with Krishna. Now, this is not to say, though, that devotees... Uh, cannot uh, choose more than one situation or what form in which to have a relationship with Krishna. So many devotees have eternal roles in Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Leela, and they have eternal uh, roles also in Krishna Leela at the same time. Just like Ramananda Roy is a partial expansion of, uh, of, um, of um, uh, Arjun also, and also Vishakha Devi, right? So, uh, or Lalita Devi, I forget. So there's, there's multiple forms that they take. Hanumanji is there in Ram Lila. He's also there in um, Chaitanya Lila as Murari Gupta. So in this way, we can have multiple forms like that um, uh, there. So the, the jiva's choice is always there, uh, what way they want to love Krishna. But we will discover that uh, that choice that we so-called make is actually our eternal choice uh, because it's, how can you choose anything else when that is who you are, right? That is your very essence.
Yeah. Let's go. Thank you, Prabhu. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I got the clarity. But I think, as you said, like uh, it's too difficult with this condition. Uh, whether that is right or wrong, or you know, sometimes we get tend to like uh, you know, Bal Gopal, or you know, when he is in a kind of different mood, or suddenly you jump onto Dwaraka when you hear something about, you start feeling about for Dwaraka, and you know, yeah. so it just wants to uh, clarify exactly, like kind of. Uh, Yes. Right now, the picture is very blurry. We may feel something here, something there. It's not clear. It's like when you wake up from a deep sleep, you open your eyes. And sometimes, you know, I don't know if this has happened to you, but you, you, you get off on the wrong side of the bed. You think you, you hit the wall. You think, which way am I? You forget which way you're sleeping, which direction, what room you're in, especially when you're traveling. This happens a lot. So right now we're in that situation. Our eyes are just beginning to open. Thanks to Srila Prabhupada's uh, instructions, Bhagavad Gita, our Vaishnav Sangha, our eyes are starting to open. So we may feel some things about Krishna uh, and his Leela. We may have some emotion and that is real. It's not false. Uh, nothing connected to Krishna is false. Uh, those feelings are real, but they're yet indistinct. They're still uh, blurry. You know, it's like we, you still have to rub your eyes and go, what am I looking at here? And gradually, everything starts to fall into its place. It becomes uh, very clear uh, what is exactly our role and mood. And it's very complex, right? If you ask Hanumanji, what is your relationship with the Lord? <laughs> very complex, right? As Lord Ramachandra, as a servant, but also a mood of friendship is connected with Lord Ram. A little bit of friendship is there. And then he's there as Murari Gupta in Sri Chaitanya Mahapu's ecstatic. And what if he's one, maybe he's one of the monkeys in Vrindavan also, right? Taking butter from Krishna's hand. So, so many different, uh, because it says that Lord Ram rewarded all the monkeys yes. uh, for their seva in Krishna Leela by feeding them a uh, makhan with his own hand. Right? So all these moods are there. Braj, Chaitanya Leela, Ram Leela. It's not clear to us, right? It's, it, it all becomes gradually clear as we progress in the path of bhakti, it becomes sharp, the picture. Yeah, thank you, Prabhu. That's a very wonderful one, especially the last one, it's cleared uh, uh, very much. And thank you, thank you very much for clarifying that. Hare Krishna Prabhu, good to see you. Thank you, Sir Prabhuji. So next question will be asked by Shilpi Mataji. Uh, thank you, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, uh, that, that's a wonderful lecture. Um, I really like the point that you mentioned about what makes a um, what makes a, a book classic. So you mentioned three points, right? So one of the points you had that when it has an overflow or excess of meaning, and you get new uh, meaning, new new realizations, new understanding out of the same text. Um, I think you previously mentioned in your lectures before Nava Nava Rasa in some of the lecture before. So. Um, I just wanted to know that, uh, can you share some of your own experience, personal experience with any verse while reading Bhagavad Gita as you uh, progressed in your spiritual life, how it changed meaning or how it added on to what you had already understood about that verse? Yes, yes. So I can give uh, uh, one example from my own life and one from uh, the, the ideal uh, student of Bhagavad Gita who is Arjun. Uh, but let's start with Arjun first. I think his example is a lot more profound. But he says, um, yeah, you know, when, when Arjun is there on the battlefield and he doesn't want to fight. So after he listens to the whole Bhagavad Gita, then he says, Karishye vachanam tava. I'm going to do as you like, Krishna. Now I will, I will act according to your instructions, which means what? He will stand up and fight on the battlefield. So after listening to Bhagavad Gita, at that point in his life, from Krishna, the result of that is he stands up and fights on the battlefield. Now, sometime later, after the Mahabharata war is over and after Yudhishthira Maharaj has ruled for some time, Krishna has departed this world. And this is described in the first canto Bhagavatam. Krishna has departed this world. Uh, Arjun is in a state of deep uh, grief, remembering the Lord, uh, feeling a lot of separation from Krishna, Vira. And as he's uh, feeling that separation, he is remembering Krishna's instructions on the battlefield. In other words, he's remembering Bhagavad Gita to give him a feeling of solace 
and remove his separation. After he remembers that instruction of Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, he feels much better. He, is, he becomes once again clear on what his duty is. And you know what he does, what his duty is? He, along with his four brothers, they depart uh, the kingdom and they go to the uh, Himalayas, renunciation. Now, think about this. The first time when Arjun heard Bhagavad Gita, the message, he wanted to go to the Himalayas at that time. And Krishna says, no, 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 you got to stay here and fight. Right? That was what he got from Gita, stand and fight. The same Gita he remembered, recited. I mean, for him, he is at that time, you hear, you memorize. So he's basically reading Bhagavad Gita again in his mind. And what did he get out of the Gita then? The exact opposite thing, which was to go uh, to the Himalayas and stop fighting in this world. Give up all your politics and duties and all. Same teaching, same words at different times in his life, a different part, different aspect of that message uh, 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 spoke to him. And Krishna's instructions on vairagya and renunciation became more powerful. So in this way, we can also experience that at different times, we can read the same verse again. It means something else in a different way. Uh, one very little example for me was this verse, uh, chapter six, yoginam api sarvesham madgate nam taratmana. Shraddhavan bhajate yumam samay yukta tamomata. Krishna says of all the different yogis, the one who is devoted to me with shraddha and worships me, bhajate yumam, that he is the highest of all yogis. Samay yukta tama is the best yogi. Uh, so I, I, have, I have, of course, obvi- always appreciated that verse. Uh, this is a verse that Prabhupada highlights many times. But if you look at the context of Bhagavad Gita, that verse it makes it even more powerful. And it's a simple thing, but for years I never recognized this, that just before this verse, Krishna says, tapasvi bhyadiko yogi, that a yogi is better than the tapasvi, the, the one who is doing ascetic practice, uh, austerities, is better than uh, the uh, karmi, is better than the jnani, Therefore, Arjun, tasmat yogi bhavarjuna. Therefore, be a yogi. And then he says, of all the different kinds of yogis you can be, my bhakta is the best. Now, that context makes the verse twice as powerful because Krishna has just built a hierarchy, putting the yogi at the top of all the different forms and then puts his bhakta at, to- at the top of that hierarchy. And what's even more is that that happens at the end of a chapter, which is not about bhakti at all. This is the chapter that's focused on dhyan yoga, the physical ashtanga yoga practice. That's the topic of the chapter. And Krishna is putting this at the end of that chapter. Right? So that if you look at the context of that verse, it was like, wow, I've read it for so many years. And I didn't recognize just how powerful that verse is when you look at the surrounding context. So this was some years ago. And, uh, and um, you know, it was like, so anyway, you read Bhagavad Gita and, and this will often happen with Srila Prabhupada's purports also. You read something in the purport and you think, wow, I've read that verse and that purport many times and I never noticed this sentence. This is so interesting, so powerful what he says. here. Or you're going through something in life and you, you hear it and you read it and you think, this is speaking exactly to me. This is what I need to hear. You can open the Bhagavad Gita at random and the Gita speaks to you. Just what you need to hear. So in this way, Krishna is there. He's living in the Bhagavad Gita. Thank you, Prabhuji. And I feel like uh, maybe Gandhi and Oppenheimer, the examples that you shared, probably they were also looking for a certain thing and they found their answers in those chapters. But probably the difference is that they stopped at those chapters and they did not go beyond it. So... Right, thank you so much. Exactly. Thank you, Mataji. Now I'll invite uh, Shraddha Mataji. Hare Krishna Prabhu. 
Thank you for the wonderful deliberation. Um, I just finished reading chapter nine and I started chapter 10. So what a perfect timing for this mm -hmm. class to just describe the whole thing. And it just, again, I think the classic definition um, fits very well in the context of Sriman Bhagavatam as well, because again, so I never thought of this part, uh, looking at Gita from Bhishma Dev. I was just reading it like, the text, but wonderful dimension added to those verses again. So probably I'll go back to them and read them again. Thank you so very much. So Prabhu, my question here was, and this question came to my mind at the time when I read it, the first verse that you uh, spoke about today, um, Bhishma Dev looks at Krishna in his four-handed form. So um, was Krishna really present in his four-handed form? Or was that Bhishma Dev's meditative form in his mind? Um, I was confused about that because as far as I remember, Krishna uh, drives Arjun's chariot to the place where Bhishma Dev, Bhishma Dev was with others. So um, I just wanted to know that was everybody seeing the Lord in his four-handed form or it was just Bhishma Dev? So whether he was there in Bhishma Dev's mind uh, as the four-handed form, or he was actually there, there's actually no difference between the two. When a pure devotee sees Krishna in his mind, Krishna is actually there. It's not just a mental uh, figure. Uh, Krishna's, Krishna, there's no difference between the Lord's, the Lord actually appears within the mind of the devotee, right? And that appearance is every bit as real as any other appearance of the Lord. So um, Krishna appears in that four-handed form uh, before Arjun. Now, whether others um, were seeing Krishna as four-armed or not, I don't know, actually. I, I don't think Prabhupada explains that in the purport. Maybe he does, and I've forgotten. But I don't know if others were seeing him in his Chaturbhuja Rupa or in his two-handed form. Uh, it's the text does not the, the Bhagavatam doesn't make clear, but Bhishma Dev is seeing Krishna in that form, yeah. and so we have every confidence that Krishna is actually appearing in his Chaturbhuja form. Because when a devotee wants to see Krishna in a particular form, Krishna is very obliging to that devotee, and he appears in just that form uh, that he likes. Uh, there's one story of when Tulsi Das Ji went to a, a Krishna temple. And he sing, sung this very beautiful Doha, where he said that, my dear Lord, I know you are the same, my Ram, you're the same, but I much prefer you with the bow and arrow than with the flute. And it is said that Krishna in that form of the Murti put down his flute and he picked up his bow. Right? So this is, this is uh, Krishna is appearing, uh, um, he, is, uh, he, he appears in a form that is conducive that is suitable for the devotee's meditation. Ye yatha maam prapadyante tam sathaiva bhajam yaham. Of course, that is not uh, always true with us because we may concoct some form of Krishna, then Krishna is not forced to appear. That I want Krishna to come in this form or that form. No, something from our mind. But the, the mind of the devotee and Krishna's own form, they are no difference, right? It, the devotee's mind is the residence of the Lord. It's the temple of the Lord. So whatever form the devotee wants to see, Krishna's form becomes installed within the devotee's mind. Therefore, it is said that you can make Krishna's murti of different uh, um, items. I think it's seven or something like that, items, uh, like of wood, of metal, uh, of, um, of earth, clay, right? Different things. Um, one of those is the form within the mind. And the, the, the form of the Lord within the mind is not any less substantial or real than the form uh, uh, that we might make from any other elements like that. Is that okay? Thank you, Prabhu. That's, that's wonderful reconciliation. I guess that's just perfect. Prabhu, I had one more question, but this is a rather a personal question in the sense that I've heard in... Um, previous lectures also about you, that you were homeschooled with Bhagavatam as your uh, curriculum. I wanted to know about that. I'm really curious that you were brought up, you and your brother, your younger brother too, uh, 
you were brought up uh, in in the US and uh, you you were homeschooled with bhagavatam as a curriculum so if you could just talk a little bit about that prabhu yeah so that's a a big topic i'll just say two two lines here and then and maybe point you in in a direction where you can uh, uh get some more information but uh, shrimad bhagavatam is such a wonderful book that number one it purifies the character of anyone who reads it and it helps us recover remember our relationship with krishna right this is the ultimate goal of studying shrimad bhagavatam nashta prayesh va bhadreshu nityam bhagavata sevaya it's it's spiritually transformative but in addition to that one of the side effects of that spiritual transformation propad explains that the material is always the product of the spiritual not the other way around the psyche like the soul can create the body but the body cannot create the atma the soul so uh, one of the side effects of studying shrimad bhagavatam is that it also helps us very much academically it it makes us very good in terms of critical thinking uh, uh logic um reason uh, uh philosophy language comprehensions even things basic things like spelling vocabulary grammar i mean propa's english in the bhagavatam is so amazing uh, so advanced the analogies you know one of the things they used to i don't know if they still do anymore but college entrance examinations they used to have analogy questions x is to y as as this is to this you know and bhagavatam is full of analogies and those are usually really tough questions but for someone who studies bhagavatam it's like oh yeah you know this is car and driver is soul and body okay we do this all the time so bhagavatam is is very powerful like that and very useful as the cornerstone of education so we learned uh, besides mathematics then we learned most of our english language subject through shrimad bhagavatam and uh, my mother has given many seminars on this topic uh, which are very very nice you can find online on youtube um also her name is aruddha uh, aruddha devi dasi a r u d d h a aruddha and um she has also written uh, a couple of books um uh where she describes the method for how she does this it's called shrimad bhagavatam a comprehensive guide for young readers uh and you can find these on amazon um and she's producing one for each canto of shrimad bhagavatam so three cantos are done now and progressing on on further and each one is very tailored exactly to the children's needs but a lot of adults get benefit from it also uh so it's got chapter summaries uh language exercises a uh, key themes of every chapter higher thinking questions for discussion uh with your children um so it's a wonderful but there's a process to do it it's not just the textbook there's a process for reading bhagavatam with your kids and that is laid out in the introduction to that book uh shrimad bhagavatam a comprehensive guide for young readers um so you can find it on amazon so i would uh encourage you to go there if you want to know more about this topic sure prabhu thank you so very much hari krishna hari krishna thank you mata ji mahi hari krishna prabhu hari krishna um, i had a question regarding a verse in the bhagavad gita it's verse 3 uh 37 from chapter 3 and the first sentence from the purport says when a living entity comes in contact with the material creation his eternal love for krishna is transformed into lust so i actually had a question as to how do we even come into contact with the material creation if we're in this spiritual world with krishna how is it possible for us to come into this i understand that we have free will but if we were serving krishna with all our love how would that even happen mm. so um this is actually the um million dollar question as in at, at every religious tradition in the world struggles with the question of how did we get into this mess to begin with the origin of our mess Uh, in fact this is uh called um in in western theology in christianity for example this is called the problem of evil uh or and this and the attempt to resolve it is called theodicy so the problem of evil is basically the fundamental question of the problem of evil is not just why are we suffering now but why did we get into this mess to begin with now the very nature of free will so the answer to the question is free will 
Uh, but, but you're right in that if we're totally satisfied and if we're happy, then why would we want to exercise free will in that direction? But here's the thing, the very nature of free will or of the word freedom, in fact, but the very nature of will, rather, of will, free will, is that it is unexplainable, right? It is spontaneous. It has no, it is not the product of any other cause. So, for example, um, if, if someone were to come and pinch you, okay, you would react. <sighs> Right? Now, you could say, was that your free will to react like that? Well, n not really. I mean, maybe part of the free will was that how loud you shouted or how angry you got. But in effect, the, the fundamental reaction was directly caused by someone else's misbehavior in pinching you. Right? Now, in the same way, if one day um, you're really happy because uh, you got, um, you know, excellent scores on an exam, uh, we might say, well, what is the cause of your happiness? Is, are you happy out of your free will? And the answer is again, no, not really. It was the good exam results that made you happy, right? So, so long as you can trace a cause that leads to a result, then that result cannot be caused, to, leads to a reaction, then that reaction cannot be called free will because it's driven by something else that came before it. Is that clear so far? Yeah. So the, if we are speaking of free will, it's something that is truly free. It has to be causeless. It cannot have a cause that comes before it. This means that when we decide to come to the material world, that is our fundamental exercise of free will. In reality, we don't have a lot of free will in this world. Once we're in this world, we're acting and reacting according to our circumstances. Right? We're driven, we're, we're like Pavlov's dogs. We're kind of conditioned to act in certain ways. But that decision, do I want to serve Krishna or not, is truly a free decision. And it's, if it's truly a free will decision, that means that it has no good cause as an explanation. So if I were able to tell you that Mahi, the reason we enter the material world is because one day Krishna got upset at us or because there's actually a little bit of, you know, evil in our hearts, or if I had any good explanation for that, it would not be a truly free decision. And therefore it would not be free will. So when we dig and dig and dig and say, why did Mahi do this? Because of this. Why did she do this? Because of this. Why did she do this? Because of this. Why did she do this? Because of this. And then we keep going back and back and back. What is that first decision which, for which we have no explanation? That is an actual free will decision. That is what is free will. And that is the decision of us deciding, I don't want to serve Krishna. I'd rather be Krishna myself. Right? So this is why that question is unanswerable, because it's free, because it's free. Uh, I don't know, perhaps you've heard also, we describe Krishna's mercy as causeless mercy. Maybe you've heard that phrase, causeless. Because if we could trace a cause, that means we can control the mercy. Right? If I do this puja, Krishna is merciful to me. So I do that puja, Krishna is merciful to me. So is it Krishna's free will? Nope. He's driven. He's controlled by something. Causes mercy is that mercy for which we have no explanation because it is a product of Krishna's free will. Right? So Krishna may have an explanation, but we don't because it's his free will. In the same way, we have to dig within our own hearts and we have to ask ourselves this question. Why? Why have I given up Krishna's association? Why have I given up my desire to serve Krishna? That's a question that you can only answer for yourself. I can only answer for myself. We cannot give a general answer to that question. Otherwise, it would be not free. Is that okay? Yes, Ravaji, that is really a wonderful answer. I just had a second point that I wanted to bring up. 
Um, then if it would be our own decision to come down here, there's really no guarantee as to if we went back that we would come back down. Like it still depends on us and our free will, right? Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. The possibility is always there because Krishna will never force us into anything and he will never take away that free will. But Srila Prabhupada says that after we experience our long and painful journey in the material world, we remember that like a bad, bad dream, like a nightmare, and we don't want to go back, right? So some people never have to learn it the hard way. We, unfortunately, you and I, we had to learn it the hard way. And that's okay, you know, it's okay. Some, some people experience it and they learn some people. So those who don't have to experience, they're called Nitya Siddhas. They're eternally liberated. But us, we have to try it out. But the good thing is, once we actually try it out and we learn our lesson and we go through that cycle, the chances of going, coming back, of us misusing it are so low, they're so small that Krishna says, Yad gatva na nivartante tad dhama paramam mama. He says, one who goes to my abode never comes back. Right? He, he's so confident that we're not going to repeat this mistake that he just says it as a rule. You don't come back again. So I don't think we need to worry that if I, if I do this once, then I might end up back here again. Highly, highly unlikely. Thank you very much, Prabhuji. Thank you. Thank you for that nice question. Thanks, Lord Mahi. It's such a wonderful, important question you asked. And uh, let me ask now Ramchandra Prabhuji. Uh, Gopal Prabhu had a question. He can go first. It's okay. Okay, Prabhuji. So after Gopal Prabhuji, Prabhuji can ask. Gopal Prabhuji, please go ahead. Hare Krishna Prabhu. <clears throat> My question is a little deviation from the stream of the thoughts. Mahi brought in, Sardha Mataji brought in, all the wonderful devotees brought in. Um, <clears throat> first of all, my humble gratitude for your uh, words of wisdom and the presence in this congregation. Thank you so much for your time. Um, <clears throat> question, little deviation. I'm just feeling hesitant to put it here. Um, Krishna spoke um, the Uddhav Gita as well. And uh, there is uh, this uh, Bhagavad Gita as well. So we have a lot of emphasis on Bhagavad Gita. Uh, is there any uh, instructions from uh, Srila Prabhupada uh, wherein he has importance for Uddhav Gita as well? And how do we as devotees uh, take the two uh, instructions like uh, directly from Krishna? Mm. A very nice question. No deviation at all. Um, very relevant to the topic. Actually, um, Bhagavad Gita uh, is, uh, Prabhupada described as the ABCs of spiritual life. Right? It takes us right from the beginning of, I'm not this body, I'm the spirit soul, do your duty in this world, don't be attached. So it takes us off from all the basics, and that in itself is a lot. I mean, it's very advanced, even though it's basic, but it's very advanced. Prabhupada says in the introduction to Bhagavad Gita, that if you study this one book nicely, no other book is necessary, right? So uh, Gita has everything in it. At the same time, Uddhav Gita is wonderful. It's really, it's, it's, it's quite long. It's very detailed, very advanced knowledge. And um, uh, the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam is a canto that um, unfortunately Srila Prabhupada did not uh, uh, get to translate. Uh, he departed this world just near the beginnings of the 10th canto of Bhagavatam. Uh, but the Uddhav Gita is quoted many times by Srila Prabhupada throughout his books. And in fact, it is one of the most commented sections of Srimad Bhagavatam in our Sampradaya. So if you look at the Gaudiya Vaishnava Acharyas going all the way back uh, to the six Goswamis of Vrindavan, their commentaries on Uddhav Gita are extraordinarily long, very detailed. And all the Acharyas, including Srila Prabhupada, quote frequently from Uddhav Gita and, and Krishna's instructions there. The three different levels of devotees, for example, the process of deity worship is quoted again and again. So many things are there in um, in in eleventh uh, 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 canto uh, Uddhav Gita. So, uh, but that Uddhav Gita is quite advanced. Uh, Prabhupada asked us to study Srimad Bhagavatam systematically from first, second, third, fourth, five, fifth, and he says in the preface to Bhagavatam that one who progresses like this in a systematic way. 
can, uh, can uh, appreciate and receive the full benefit of this Srimad Bhagavatam. So therefore it's a very, it's much more detailed, much more advanced uh, than, than, the, than the Bhagavad Gita that we typically know. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's very important for devotees and very much worth studying the Uddhav Gita. But when we distribute Gita uh, publicly, uh, when we speak about it in classes and so on, we always read Bhagavad Gita, uh, the 700 verses, because that is the starting point uh, for Krishna consciousness. It is something that is appreciable both to the newcomer and to the advanced devotee. Everyone can appreciate and get so much out of Bhagavad Gita. Uddhav Gita is a little bit more challenging. It's often very technical and very advanced subjects, different aspects Krishna is describing because his, the whole context is different. Uh, here he's speaking to Arjun as he's acting in the world, like all of us are. He's a man of the world. And he's in a state of illusion, ignorance. Uh, not, uh, not because he's ignorant, but because Krishna places him in that situation. So he's, he's like every man. He's like all of us in a state of ignorance and acting in the world. Uddhav, on the other hand, when Krishna speaks to him, he's already very advanced. He's one of the Yadavs. He's one of Krishna's very close friends. Uh, he's not in a state of ignorance. He's feeling deep separation because Krishna is about to leave this world. So it's a very different audience, very different context. That's all. Otherwise, both Gitas are very important. For uh, Gaudiya Vaishnavas, the, the Uddhav Gita is very, very relishable very philosophically important. Thank you so much, Prabhu, um, for clarifying that. And one another thing I just want to bring to your attention, um, <clears throat> that uh, this is the book I have, the one you mentioned. And this is amazingly wonderful book. And uh, it's a boon for the kids to get the hang of what Bhagavatam is. So yes. I recommend everyone who has kids, get this copy. Hare Krishna. Yes. Thank you so much, Prabhuji, for your endorsement and for showing everyone what it looks like. Um, Srimad Bhagavatam, a comprehensive guide for young readers. Thank you. Thank you, Gopal Prabhuji. Thank you very much, Gopal Prabhuji, for showcasing the book. Um, so, yes, Prabhuji, Ramchandra Prabhuji, you can go ahead and ask a question. You're muted, Prabhu. Thank you. As always, very wonderful explanation. Um, I have two questions. One is, um, we, were, we, were, we were explaining in the beginning, and one of the words, the translation was uh, that how... Uh, Krishna did this, uh, Bhishma is saying, for two purposes. One is to fulfill my desire and sacrifice his own promise. Uh, I, I guess sacrificing his own promise also includes protecting the devotees. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, we've seen in history that you have a devotee and then you have someone who's a non-devotee. And Krishna protects the devotee, Prahlad Maharaj. Through, uh, uh, then you have um, Jagai Madai versus, you know. But in this case, I see almost like Bhishma Dev is also a devotee and Arjuna is also a devotee. And Krishna says, I protect my devotees. So if Arjuna had not stopped Krishna, would he still have gone ahead and, and, and killed Bhishma? <laughs> yes, uh, very nice question. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know what Krishna would have done. Um, usually he does not slay devotees with his own hands, right? He may set up circumstances where a devotee ends up having to go through that, uh, like he did here uh, with Bhishma Dev. The arrows, uh, you know, went through his body and ultimately those arrows are what caused him to depart. Uh, and um, there's also the story of Abhimanyu is there and so many devotees are there. That usually Krishna is setting up circumstances by which he calls his dear devotees back to him. Uh, but usually he's not doing this with his own hands. It's not a very pleasant circumstance. Unless that devotee takes the mood of uh, enmity towards the Lord. In the case of Jai and Vijay uh, and um, taking a birth as uh, Hiranyakashipu and Ravan and Shishupal. 
So in that in that way, then Krishna does it. But the the the, the mood of the devotee there is pratikun. It's against uh, Krishna and uh, and Bhishma Dev is is at no point is he pratikun. Uh, he's he's fighting as a as kshatriya in a mechanical way, but his mood is always anukul in in relation to the Lord. So again, I don't know the answer to whether Krishna would have done it, but uh, just in terms of speculating, I, I think my speculation would be it's it's unlikely uh, Krishna uh, would have found some way out of the situation uh, to not have to do something like that. But I think your question raises a very important point, which is that Krishna's protection can come in different ways. Uh, that uh, in this case, his protection is evident. Bhishma, they wanted to see Krishna's protection in the in the form of protecting Arjun physically. He wanted to see how Krishna would protect Arjun physically. But sometimes Krishna protects devotees by not protecting them physically, right? That he 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 puts them through some kind of experience which is protective for the devotee in that it brings the devotee closer to him or it brings the devotee back to Godhead and ends their miserable existence in the material world, uh, which to us may seem like, oh, Krishna is not protecting him. How could that devotee suffer like this? But uh, from the devotee's perspective, we don't know, right? From that devotee's perspective, uh, he's, he, he or she may be drawing very close to Krishna in a very personal and intimate way. So some uh, months ago when this pandemic started, I gave a class on this topic called uh, Bhakti in Times of Crisis uh, and specifically comparing Krishna's, how does Krishna protect when he does so physically and when he chooses not to protect physically, uh, how we can see Krishna's protection in both circumstances. Uh, sometimes Krishna intervenes and he helps us physically and then, then it's easier, we recognize. Uh, Krishna helps. See, he protected Arjun. But in the case of Bhishma Dev, we may question, why is Krishna not protecting him? I mean, his, his condition was so uh, difficult with all those arrows through his body. But uh, we cannot understand Krishna's protection. Bhishma Dev is feeling 100% protected by Krishna. He may be lying on a bed of arrows with blood dripping from his body, from his wounds, but he is feeling Krishna's love and protection more than anyone practically on that battlefield. So whether Krishna chooses to protect physically or not, that is up to him. But usually he doesn't attack his devotees. He doesn't go through with the attack personally. <laughs> so. Thank you. The, the second question was, uh, I, I, if I heard it right, you said Krishna is saying, I love you and, and I expect you to love me back. Is that right? So uh, in the same light, like, but want, yes. I want you to love me also. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in that regards, uh, in one of the purpose, chapter 1826, Prabhupada is saying in the purpose, the person in Krishna consciousness is always transcendental to the material modes of nature. He has no expectations for the result of the work entrusted to him because he's above false ego and pride. So when we do our duty, one of our, I guess duty, dharma is also to serve the Lord, serve the devotees. And then we must, <clears throat> just like Krishna is expecting from us, obviously if it's a transcendental love, we are also expecting back from Krishna and his devotees. And on the other side, it is, uh, we must perform our activities, which is one is loving exchanges between devotees serving the Lord without expectations. So can you explain this where should we expect or in, on the other side, not expect? Yes, yes, yes. A very, very nice question. Actually, uh, we should definitely expect Krishna's mercy. Prabhupada says specifically, I mean, uh, the, the, this is one of the symptoms of surrender. Right? That a devotee expects that Krishna will protect me. And this expectation of Krishna uh, this expectation from Krishna is shown repeatedly in Bhagavatam. When devotees have a, a, an issue, like the Brajbasis, when, when Lord Indra came and throwing the reins, or uh, when Uttara was being chased by the uh, Brahmastra weapon, when Arjun was being chased, they all come to Krishna and they, they come to Krishna because they expect him to, to protect. Now, this expectation 
is not expectation in the sense that we use the word. I think a better word is conviction. That it's not that, oh, Krishna, look, I've been your devotee for so long. Uh, now it's your turn to do something for me. That is business. And that's expectation in a business sense. No. A devotee has rather conviction that Krishna will protect me in the way that a child has every expectation that the parents will protect him during time of difficulty, right? Something is dangerous or afraid. Say, um, say a child has a nightmare at night. Okay? They come into the parent's bedroom expecting what? That they will be hugged and consoled and protected. They will feel safe. This is why they come. Now, is, is the mood of the child, look, I did my chores yesterday, and therefore tonight it's time for you to console me. Of course not, right? It's actually a pretty one-way relationship. The parents are giving, giving, giving to the children. At that age, they haven't yet had a chance to give anything in return other than their love. So in the same way, a devotee is expecting from Krishna, not because of what he has done for Krishna, because when he looks at his own life, he thinks, what have I done for Krishna? Considering how much Krishna has given me, I've done nothing for him. So what is the basis of my expectation? Only this, that I am helpless and he is my Lord. That's all. This is the only reason I expect Krishna to protect me because I have no other shelter. This is what the, the Brajbasis tell Krishna when they go to Vrindavan, when, when, uh, when, uh, be, during Govardhan Lila. They say, Krishna, we have no other shelter. They, they don't tell him, Krishna, look, you're the one who caused this whole problem, this mess to begin with, <laughs> right? Indra got upset and we warned you. Nanda Maharaj warned Krishna that Indra will get upset. We told you that we should continue this yajna and do Govardhan yajna alongside it. But you are the one who suggested that we should give up Indra yajna and do Govardhan yajna. So this was your fault. Now you protect us, you deal with it. That would be expectation in a business sense, in a material sense. But no, the Brajbasis, they simply went to Krishna and said, we have nowhere else to go. We have no other shelter, so you please help us. That's conviction more than expectation. It's conviction that Krishna will protect me. The expectation that we do not want is the business type of exchange. That is fruit of activity. That's karma. So those are two different things. One is in the material sphere, talking about that, that mentality of karma kanda. Krishna, I put this in, therefore I get this back, right? So a devotee is typically not doing a yajna. Let me do this ritual. That way Krishna will protect me in this circumstance. But does a devotee go to Krishna and say, Krishna, I'm in a tough spot. Please help me. Yes, that is not, there's nothing wrong with that. Every great Vaishnava in Bhagavatam does that. Right? But it's not an exchange for anything. A devotee doesn't say, Krishna, today I put $100 in the hundi. Please protect me. You know, I normally put 50, but today I put extra. So please especially protect me because I'm coming up for a big job interview. That would be the business exchange. A devotee will put in 100 in the hundi, but not because of anything in return, just because they want to give. That's the point. Right? So... Expectation versus conviction, I think. And in regards to devotees, is that that expectation? Because there's no conviction, like, you know, I, I, you must, you know, reciprocate with me. So is that expectation right to have? Because in Kali Yuga, we know even with devotees, uh, we go wrong. Our expectations are way off. Uh, ideally, uh, our goal should be to serve the Vaishnavas selflessly. Right? And selfless means that uh, the, we do not have conviction that the devotees will protect us or they will reciprocate or come back. That conviction is only for Krishna, right? Surrender is to Krishna. Uh, sharanagati is for Krishna. We don't do Sharanagati to the Vaishnava. For the Vaishnava, it is Seva. It is service we're doing. And Seva is best done in a selfless manner. That I'm offering the Seva whether I get anything in return, any reciprocation in return, that uh, is okay. Uh, I'm detached from that, right? Now, it's, it's easier said than done, of course, uh, means we typically expect some 
reciprocation in a relationship and we become very disheartened. Uh, and so I think the best thing to remember there is that if someone is coming to us with a desire uh, for, uh, is serving us in some way, assisting us, then we should be very careful to reciprocate because we understand everyone appreciates reciprocation. That is the, that is the foundation of love. Uh, so we do save us selflessly, but love is born from reciprocation. So if that reciprocation is there, then it is very nice. Then that relationship can flourish. Otherwise, that relationship doesn't really flourish. It becomes one-sided, uh, which is good for us. We're doing selfless seva and not expecting, but it's not so good for the relationship, for the sambandha. Thank you very much. Very beautiful explanation. Thank you. Thank you, Proji. Proji, I know it is too late and then uh, I don't know about your schedule. I have uh, four more questions, so please advise what to do. <laughs> <laughs> so it is getting a little bit late. It's been two hours now. Uh, my, uh, my answers tend to be a little long, so I apologize for that. Uh, but maybe we just take one more question uh, and then we uh, conclude for the day. Is that okay? Okay, Proji. So so uh, let me request um, Ram Tulsi Prabhuji, you there? Sorry to put you in a tough spot. <laughs> Make the choice. Prabhuji, you have a 10 seconds, otherwise I will ask next. <laughs> okay, here he is. You're muted, Prabhu. Prabhuji, you are on mute. You're, you're muted, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna Prabhu, uh, thank you so much. Hare Krishna, good to Just see you. Just wanted to, uh, <laughs> Krishna, nice to see you Prabhu, Hari Hari. So, uh, like, I mean, it's a really wonderful talk, but I just wanted to ask this um, this question in Mahabharat, actually, um, in um, what parva it is that, uh, or Sumit parva or something, uh, in chapter, it is asked that when Arjuna asks regarding uh, Krishna that, can you please repeat Bhagavad Gita again? So, at the time, Krishna sees that I already forgot, right? I cannot explain to you. So how can we explain that in that particular regard? So uh, uh, Prabhu, I don't have a, a good explanation uh, or answer to your question as to why Krishna says I forgot. Um, but let me just say this, that um, anything in Mahabharat that seems to conflict with uh, Bhagavatam or Bhagavad Gita, uh, we should always prefer the understanding of, um, of uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, right? So uh, the problem with the challenge with Mahabharata, and this is a challenge that is uh, expressed um, uh, not just by, by uh, uh, historians or scholars, but by our, our Acharyas also, that um, in, in the Mahabharata and also in certain Puranas, there can be things that are not exactly uh, historically accurate or correct. The reason for that is because over time, you start to get different versions of the same text. So Madhvacharya, he explains this uh, nicely that um, if, you, if, if you see Mahabharat as it's presented in North India is many places different. The basic story is the same, but many places, the verses, the, the, even the chapters are different than the versions in South India. Uh, both are in Sanskrit. Uh, both are, uh, you know, written by Vyasadeva or whatever. They, the same things are there, but there can be quite some variations. Over time, as the Mahabharata was recited and repeated in different uh, parts of the world and different parts of India, certain changes were introduced by human uh, addition or subtraction. Uh, so we have to be very careful. And any time the um, Mahabharata's mood uh, or message or essence is conflicting, essence won't conflict, of course, but the details are conflicting with Bhagavatam, then we prefer Bhagavatam's account. Just like uh, the birth of Maharaj Parikshit is described differently in Mahabharat than it is in Srimad Bhagavatam. We uh, take the account of uh, Bhagavatam as uh, the, high, the, the best pramana. In fact, the, the, to, to contrast the situation, the, the uh, Bhagavatam's text has not changed at all since its composition, uh, means the differences in different parts of India between manuscripts of Bhagavatam are so tiny, so small, that they're practically uh, not very significant at all. 
Whereas in, in Mahabharat, sometimes you can get an additional chapter or a whole new story or an addition to a story in one part of India versus another, both written in Sanskrit, both on the top, it'll say written by Vedyas, right? So it's very difficult to tell because of, uh, like Krishna says, yogo nashta parantapa. Over time, things get changed, they get lost. Similarly, uh, the uh, Mahabharata describes how uh, Kunti Devi, um, she, uh, when, when the Pandavas are in the Laksha uh, and uh, they're going to be burnt to death, then they discover this uh, in advance. Then uh, Kunti Devi suggests that, uh, why don't we find a mother and her five grown children and bring them into the Laksha palace and get them drunk. And once they're drunk and asleep, then we will leave quietly and burn the, the uh, palace. And then they will find their, their dead bodies and they will think we have died. Now, this is not behavior that is befitting a Vaishnav. And if we look at Queen Kunti's character in Srimad Bhagavatam, it is practically impossible to imagine such a soft hearted person who's saying, give me more troubles that she would do this to, a, to another mother and children, right? So then, okay, who's, which Queen Kunti do we want to accept? The safe uh, choice and the uh, uh, choice authorized by our Acharyas is, um, is Srimad Bhagavatam. The text of the Bhagavatam has not changed in, in its thousands of years of history. Uh, we know this for a fact historically. Uh, and uh, also our Acharyas designate it as the Amala uh, uh, Purana and the highest Pramana, the highest source of knowledge. So in this way, we want to rely on that. And with Mahabharat, yes, of course, that Katha is very important. And there are many things in, in Mahabharat which are very, very uh, exemplary and very important to learn. But we must always read and study Mahabharat under the guidance of a very capable Vaishnav and Acharya, uh, preferably in our Sampradaya, who can select what is uh, uh, tasty and what is not so tasty and distinguish properly like the hamsa, the paramahamsa, who can separate the milk from the water. Yeah. Thank you so much Prabhu, for that question. Thank you so much. Adhiri. Adhiri.